All right. So welcome uh, to the 2023-2024 Student Experience Panel at DKU. Uh, my name is Russell, and uh, I'm very excited to, to have so many of you here uh, joining us for uh, this, this fall's panel, where you're going to learn a lot from those who are living it, uh, about what it's really like to be a student at DKU and what it is, you know, what the, the what that student experience is like. And so um, I'm going to just jump right into it and I'm going to share my screen real quick so that, um, thank you for turning it off. Um, continue, yes. And so I'm going to share screen and I'm going to invite our student panelists to do a quick introduction, uh, and then we'll get started with the question. So Annie, looks like you're up first. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Annie. I am from the United States. I'm from Missouri, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, class of 2026. My major is media arts with a focus in digital culture and communication. And as you can see, I've listed all my extracurriculars here. Like my main things are photography, film, volleyball, badminton. I do a lot of uh, photography for sure. Most of the photos in the slideshow are actually mine. So yes. All right, great. And Davi. Thank you, Annie, for the great photos. Yeah, and I was very happy to put them together. My name is David. <laughs> um, I'm from Armenia. I just came here to Kunshan. I'm a freshman at DKU. And I've already picked up a few extra curricular activities, uh, ranking the top one as uh, the sailing club on which I share, hope to share more today. And I'm passionate about filmmaking and photography, and I believe that's what I want to do in the future. I'm very interested in documentary cinema, so if anyone shares interest with me, feel free to reach out. My email and Instagram are on your screen. Thank you, David. And Kendi. Hi, I'm Kendi from Kenya, class of 26. Um, my major is going to be computer science, just not decided if applied math or computation and design. My extracurriculars look kind of techy because it's all like robotics and research and yeah, the, the DKU Women in STEM is a fairly new club that I, whose executive board I sit on. So if you're interested in such things, any tech stuff, you can ask uh, for my help. My email is there, my Instagram, feel free to reach out. Great, thank you. And Leo. Hi everyone, I'm Leo Medellin. I'm from the United States, from the state of Georgia specifically. I'm from the class of 2024. So I think I'm the oldest student on the panel, which is fine. Um, I'm a molecular bioscience major, specifically in the biogeochemistry track. That's a lot of really fancy words for like um, interdisciplinary, like natural sciences, as well as like environmental science. So if you are terrible at making decisions like I am, I think you'd really enjoy something like that. Um, my main extracurricular is the GSRM, which is uh, DKU's LGBT student, um, I guess, union sort of group. Uh, we, I've been in charge of GSRM for about like two and a half years now, and it's a really great group of people. And recently I've been really active in the DKU Film Society, where we have film screenings on campus and we just talk about like movies and, you know, just appreciating cinema a lot more. Thank you, Leo. Tekla. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Tekla Takac. I'm a Hungarian student. I also happen to be a second year student as many of our panelists. My major is ethics and leadership with tracks in philosophy. And some extracurricular things I do is I engage with Super Deep. That's DKU's extracurricular philosophical ecosystem. That's just shortly to describe. I'm also working with international enrollment management. That's why I'm here. Um, I'm also the co-chair of First Year Student Advisory Council. And I do work with Logic Lab, the Philosophy Club, Sailing Club with David, and I'm also part of the Travel Club. Excellent. Thank you. And I think Tamaris is here. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> Um, yes, hello everyone. Um, sorry for this lightning, but my name is uh, Tamiris and I'm from Kazakhstan, Astana. I'm class of 2026, currently sophomore, majoring in political economy. 
my main extracurriculars are research uh, for uh, innovation and entrepreneurship love uh, in partnership with World Economic Forum. I'm also a student worker at Humanities Research Center. I've been working with HRC for more than a year. Last year, I've been doing uh, uh, I've been working as a research assistant there, and I really enjoyed it. So this year, I'm uh, I stayed there as a office assistant, uh, mostly uh, helping out with the event organization. And I'm also in the sailing club. That's more like a leisure activity together with Tecla. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not sure if Renata has been able to make it. She might have run into some delays. So um, if she pops in, let me know. And Abdullah. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me properly? Yes, I can. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I'm Abdullah. Abdullah bin Javed, to be exact. I'm from Lahore, Pakistan. A city, a lot of, I'm not sure how many of you know, but I'm from Pakistan. I'm also a sophomore currently majoring in behavioral science with tracks in neuroscience. Um, still deciding between the exact interest with like more being towards behavioral science or neuroscience. Uh, some of the things that I love to do on, on campus is mostly a lot of filmmaking. That's kind of my personal interest. These days, it's not so much an interest. I, I do a lot of sports, gym. Uh, I love football um, and any sports that I can try on. I love traveling. I've traveled in, in, I think I've traveled five cities within China and a lot of, a lot of places within the, each of those cities. So I definitely would love to get in touch with you if you're into that and photography is something that's a huge huge passion of mine i wasn't able to list it here but like the things that i've been involved on with campus has mostly got to do with residence life i'm an ra working with residence life to make it a more inclusive community and also working with intercultural engagement committees to make this campus a more inclusive space for everyone i'm really excited that all of you are here and if you have any questions there's my email and there's my instagram that's we can we can talk thank you Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the panelists. And also, I just want to let everyone know, um, I, I know we've got people all around the world today uh, in this panel. And, uh, you know, I know some of you are in some crazy hours, including all of our panelists. So I think it's around 11 o'clock at night right now. So really grateful for your uh, willingness to share at this late hour. And I certainly know that some of our panelists are experiencing some late hours as well as some very early hours. Um, so, you know, as a global university, you know, we're we're doing business globally right now and uh you know we're adjusting and trying to you know meet as many of those time zones as we can um so i'm just going to go ahead and get started and uh oh and just to let kind of our attendees know how this is going to work we're going to ask some questions of our panelists um abdullah actually is going to help us manage the chat so you have a chat box you'll probably see if you're familiar with zoom where you can be popping questions in throughout um we'll look at some of you know if, if abdullah can answer those questions if i can answer those questions we'll try to answer those and then we'll save some questions for the panelists later on um and of course we'll leave a little time at the end for those questions whether we're pulling them from the chat um, or you're just asking questions at the conclusion of this. Um, so just to give you an idea of how we're going to move forward. Um, but all that said, we're going to get started with the first question. And so, um, Tekla, I see you first on my screen. So you'll get the first shot at, at, at answering this first question. And then we'll ask everybody else to follow in and I'll invite each person to come up. The first question is, I mean, let's start from the beginning, right? What was it like to transition to China? And maybe you can share what were some of the biggest surprises and maybe the biggest challenges that you faced making that transition. Well, I think one of the biggest challenge for me was the language. I came to China with basically no Chinese knowledge and I very quickly had to realize that they do not speak English here very often. So that was a bit tough in the beginning, but luckily like classmates around campus were able to help me through that part. But generally coming to China, um, I wouldn't say I had much expectations, but I do know that um, like from my culture, I did bring some like um, perceptions of towards China that happened to be not true whatsoever. So I was quite surprised when I came to China because I expected it to, I don't know, the, I had a lot of stereotypes to say the least, um, but generally speaking, I was very surprised and I'm just happy I made that transition. All right, great. Uh, Kendi, I think, uh, I think you're next in line on my screen. Um, I think 
maybe same situation is Tekla with the language, but I think when I came here, I already had had a semester of Chinese language. So I was a bit, I, co I could say my hellos and get by, but the other thing was like getting settled in that you have to like take a medical exam and get your like permanent residence, like the legal stuff. Um, they, you, I mean, it's it's a bit difficult to like get used to because in like most countries you just get in and just do your thing. But in China, like to get legal residence is a bit of like, you have to go to the police station and get a like medical checkup done. But we have help for that in school. Just get your stuff together, get your documents together. When you're told to submit them, submit them and everything will be fine. But that was that was a new thing to me, to like do extra things to be a resident. All right, thank you. Sorry for that dog explosion there. Somebody, uh, somebody hit our front door. Um, David, uh, I'll just build on uh, what uh, was just said. Um, for me, most challenging part was during the orientation week when uh, we had to do the medical checkup and open our bank accounts. Um, so when it all summed up with a lot of new people, it was kind of hard to balance all that. Um, uh, but the process of opening a bank account and going for health checkup, as um, scary and hard it might sound, uh, it was actually an adventure for me. Uh, and looking back at it, I think those would be one of my best memories uh, from this year. And yes, indeed, as Candy said, it's a different experience, uh, but I can reassure you, uh, you'll like it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Annie. Yeah, so I'd like to basically echo what the rest of them have said. I think the biggest challenge is basically just adjusting during your first month because uh, I think there's a lot of... China really likes to use a lot of different apps. Like their living style is quite different from what I'm used to. So it took me a while to get used to everything. But after about a month of living here, you sort of get used to figure out what's useful, what's not, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And language is another thing. But I think that having a translator helped a lot. So I think those were the biggest challenges for me. All right. Thank you. And Tamaris, I think you I think you went out and then came back in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so if we'll start from the very beginning, um, I kind of agree with other people. But uh, at the same time, um, for me, it wasn't that challenging for some reason uh, of course there are a lot of things that you need to figure out at first but uh the fact that i had to do that with like a lot of friends together and we all were confused but at the same time there were a lot of student workers uh from international student services who were like uh consulting us regularly and reminding us of what we should do um and there are like group chats to help us out with very mundane things like ordering food or something like that so um, for me, maybe the sense of community did not make it as challenging as it was. So for me, it wasn't, it was pretty chill and, um, I enjoyed that period as well. All right. Great. So I think, I think we've got everybody and everybody's responded. So I'm going to move on and you guys touched on this just a little bit. So I'm curious, and can you share with, with our attendees, what your level of Mandarin was when you arrived. So many of our students come with varying levels, including no experience in Mandarin. Uh, so what was your level of Mandarin when you arrived? And for those of you in particular who had little to no Mandarin ability, how was it getting around, going off campus, and how quickly were you comfortable going off campus? Um, so David, I'm going to start with you. You mentioned my name, right? Yes, sorry, yes. Uh, so I came here with zero Mandarin experience and with a big perception that it's a very hard language to learn. Uh, but I'm very surprised to the amount of Mandarin I learned in four months I've been here. And now I can say, I think uh, saying that I comfortably can go out is an overstatement, but I will make that overstatement. Uh, yes, I can comfortably go out uh, and, you know, put a few sentences together even, like explain myself, maybe ask questions to the locals and just whatever doesn't work, you use the translation app and learning the progress. 
uh, I have a note with the new Chinese words from every day that I learned. And yeah, I'm quite surprised to the amount of Chinese I learned. And another thing I'll say uh, that the classes at DKU, the Mandarin classes at DKU are built in a way that uh, you learn and you do not even notice that. So it kind of builds up floor by floor. And um, we'll, we'll hear from sophomores and people of higher classes how it goes for them, I hope. And I'm really excited to get to their level. I'm really jealous to you guys. Your Mandarin is so much better. <laughs> All right. Um, Tamir, so I'm going to come back to you because you kind of talked about your comfort level being, you know, pretty good when you when you got here. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, I am one of those students who came here with zero Mandarin. I never learned Chinese and I didn't know anything about it. Um, thus far, I'm studying it for the second, like the second year. And um, I also think that I am doing quite a good progress. Like I can uh, go around pretty easily. And also with the help of translator, you can basically do anything you want and ask for anything you want. Um, a good experience with explaining to the taxi driver to go to the campus as quick as possible. Um, and I did well. <laughs> so yeah, um, and honestly, that is amazing if you have some Chinese before, but if you're coming here with zero Chinese, like I would say I would make a bold statement that people who came with pretty good, decent Chinese here missed out on amazing Chinese classes here together mm -hmm. with all other peers. All right. Thank you. Um, Annie, I see you next in line. Okay. I'm also one of those people who came to China with basically no Mandarin experience. So I started off in 101. And after coming to China, I think I think my Chinese has improved quite a lot. I can say right now, next semester, I'll be taking Chinese 301. So what I believe is most important about Chinese is that you shouldn't be afraid to speak it. I go out and speak a lot. And you should being in China is a great experience to improve your Mandarin because you're surrounded by it constantly. So if you really want to improve your Chinese, then I suggest like engaging with the environment. Don't be, don't be afraid to not, don't be afraid to speak Chinese because uh, at the end of the day, uh, you, you won't improve if you don't try. And also, even if you don't have superb Chinese skills, even if you're not fluent, I think that, uh, most of the time by just pointing and using body language as well to accompany your Chinese, a lot of people can understand you. You become a master of nonverbal communication. <laughs> and Tekla. Um, I feel like a lot of people before me have said mostly what I wanted to say, but there's two things I would like to highlight. One of them is I think what's very important in terms of coming to China in the beginning is to just not be afraid to mess up or even get yourself into potentially uncomfortable situations because that's how you really learn. And second of all, I think it's also important to highlight that through the Kiryu's curriculum, Chinese curriculum specifically, they for I wouldn't say force because that's a bit of a bad word, but they we have assignments which require us to go off campus and actually practice Chinese outside of the classroom, which really helps with accommodating and getting to China very smoothly, very quickly. Thank you. Candy. Um, I think I actually came here like this year, January. So I had taken like a semester of Chinese before coming here. I think in the beginning, I was one of those people who were like afraid to speak Chinese because I remember like my drive from the airport to school, the driver was trying to make a conversation, but I was like, I don't speak Chinese. That's all I said. And it was a silence to our drive. But nowadays, I feel like I start the conversation with a taxi driver and not the other way around. Because once you learn from like class, it's easy to like get around. You can get a taxi, you can order your coffee, you can go out shopping. So I feel like if you don't like, don't be afraid to like go try. And I think we really like, we learn so well, like Tekla said. So the curriculum is good. It's going to help you get around. You'll be taught like useful and necessary stuff. So it's it's going to work out well. It's It's not as hard as it seems in the beginning. Thank you, Candy. That's assuring. Uh, and, and Leo. I'm mostly in the same camp as Annie is. It's like, even when you feel lacking in your verbal communication, there's like so much you can do with like facial expressions and like context. Um, what I lack in like Mandarin ability, I make for 
in like audacity. So <laughs> if like, if I can get through a conversation in English, I'm like, okay, would you be comfortable teaching me how to say that in Mandarin? And so now I can like order my coffee, you know, talk to the delivery drivers, you know, ask how they're, I talk to taxi drivers. It's really fun. I like lie to them about where I'm from, which I don't recommend, but it's like, you, you learn to have fun with it so that it's not really scary if you do get into a situation where you're like, mm, I don't know what's happening. You have to make it fun, otherwise you're gonna like be scared of it. And it's it's really not that scary. It's a way to appreciate this culture that you're trying to like embed yourself within. Very good, thank you, Leo. So moving on to our next question, um, let's kind of start talking about now that you're in China, um, you know, you're having lots of different experiences. You kind of reflect on some of those experiences and some of you have been there longer than others. Um, what has been your favorite experience in China to date? Um, maybe you can include what were some of your favorite cities that you have visited so far? Um, and, and just overall, you know, what made the experience kind of stand out? What made it special? And I am going to start this time uh, with Candy. Well, I was trying to like put everything together, but I'll go for like the closest answer and the closest city, Shanghai. So I feel like everyone has this sort of attachment to Shanghai, a DKU. We believe in Shanghai so much and we trust and love Shanghai because you can literally go out, you can go shopping, you can eat foods from like different countries. Everything you need is in Shanghai. You need a museum, it's in Shanghai. You need to go see a movie, Shanghai. You need to go see a musical, Shanghai. It's cheap, it's close. Shanghai is a big city, but I think going out to Shanghai with my friends is like my biggest highlight because we tend to go to Shanghai a lot. There's new things to do every time, celebrate birthdays, go see a movie, go see a musical. Yeah, Shanghai is a great city and it's really pretty, especially at night. And for those of you who don't know, Shanghai is, it's a 19 minute high speed train ride, but to be frank, it's probably about a 45 minute, 50 minute door to door trip from campus to maybe the heart of Shanghai or depending on where you're going in Shanghai. Um, and I think it's still about $3 for the train ticket of that, you know, to, to actually get to Shanghai. Um, all right, so Leo, I'm gonna invite you up next on this one. Um, I do agree with Candy, I love Shanghai, but I think, um, I've I've tried to like start nearer and like branch out. Um, I've fallen in love with like downtown Quinshan in the past year or so, especially because um, there's a lot of like little hidden gems that I wouldn't expect. Um, there's you know a Taiwanese style night market because there's a lot of um, uh, uh, sort of I guess immigrants from Thailand from Thailand from Taiwan here. Um, and just like really nice coffee shops that are that are a really easy like trip from campus if you don't want to like you know take the hour and a half trip to like get into Shanghai, um, and also like some of the really smaller malls that are not too expensive um, if you just want to do some window shopping or just maybe like find a cute outfit. Um, but I don't recommend retail therapy; it can get really out of hand even if you're in China. All right, thanks, um, Annie. I really am trying to think. I think most people will say their experience is traveling. I've done a lot of traveling, especially in my first year. I traveled down to Guangdong province, which is like a three hour flight down in the south of China. Uh, I really liked sort of going out and exploring with friends, even in Quinshan in Shanghai. I feel like there's always something new you can find. And I think the most memorable thing for me was during the spring festival or like the Chinese New Year, I went to a Chinese friend's home and we celebrated together with their family. And at that moment, I felt really happy because I was integrated within the culture. I got to experience it. I got to enjoy a good meal. Uh, I made some good friends from it and it felt really nice. E even if I'm so far away from home, I still felt like I was enjoying things with family and friends. Very nice. Uh, Davi. So I didn't have uh, many opportunities to tra travel around uh, China. Of course, Shanghai, I love Shanghai, but I think I'll focus on Kunshan and specifically exploring Kunshan through cycling. Um, uh, Kunshan has a very developed uh, network of uh, cycling roads. And, you know, I like taking it slow, you know, maybe taking a turn that you would otherwise not turn in a taxi. And especially I like cycling with my friends. Uh, just uh, the, uh, yesterday, 
uh, we went cycling at 5 a.m. to meet the sunset all together. And we went to the park nearby. It was very beautiful. So yeah, if you're into that, uh, certainly uh, you have many opportunities to do that. Also, you can take your bike on the train to Shanghai and explore Shanghai through cycling too. Great, thank you. Tamaris. Um, I would like to recall two specific events and um, although traveling and exploring Kanchan is amazing, but I'm thinking about two events that were hosted at Dickey U uh, on campus. One of them is the International Expo that was hosted last year uh, in March, I think. And it was an amazing event where the students from different backgrounds, different cultures could wear their traditional national cloths, um, make their dishes, uh, perform, uh, sing, dance their traditional dances or uh, traditional songs, play their uh, national games. and. It was so cool. Uh, although DKU is very diverse and you experience that on a day-to-day -day basis, but that kind of fest just shows it all um, at, at its best. And I really loved it. Um, and the second event is a um, relatively recent one. Uh, last week, last weekend, we had an invitational tournament uh, with other international joint um partnership universities uh, in China and around uh, Jiangsu, Kunshan area. We had Liverpool, uh, Nottingham, and NYU Shanghai, and Wuhan University. Uh, we had uh, in tournaments and games in basketball, football, volleyball, badminton, table tennis. And it was amazing. It was literally like a weekend, a scene from a movie where all different kinds of universities come together, compete with each other, cheer for each other. Uh, and it was just amazing to meet all those new people. They also, the tournament was two days long. So we've had a chance to meet each other, to have some social events together. Um, and it was just amazing. Wow. <laughs> I can feel the enthusiasm and excitement. Yeah, not to mention that you also feel that connection with DKU when you're against other schools. So it's <laughs> it's an amazing opportunity. Thank you, thank you. And Tekla? Um, I would like to take a similar approach as Leo to go from the nearby to the far away. So I think some of my favorite memories at DK so far are like the very spontaneous nights I have with my friends. So let that be a late night walk around campus or going somewhere. I mean, traveling in China, like even on a small scale, it's very safe and very cheap. Like taxis are cheap. So around campus, there are free bikes that are available. So generally, I'd say on campus and like near campus, those are my favorite memories, like going out for a eating somewhere or like cycling somewhere. But probably my favorite travel experience so far is Hainan province, which is an island province on, in the south of China and specifically the city of Haikou because I traveled there with a Chinese friend. It was just the two of us. And that's where I really got to learn about like Chin Chinese culture itself and how everything works. Uh, my friend pushed me out of my comfort zone, tried to get me to speak Chinese, even though my Chinese was not good. <laughs> so generally speaking, I feel like those were the moments where I really got to learn about Chinese culture as well. Great stuff, y'all. Um, so we have our next question uh, for the panelists. And let's go a little bit more on the academic side. So maybe you can share with the attendees, what has been your favorite class you know that you've taken so far you know it kind of an and or or who has been your favorite professor at dku so far um you can address both of those one or the other and and just give a little insight into why and so i'm going to start with uh Tamaris this time so uh i'm majoring in political economy so most of my classes are uh econ political science related but so far, my favorite class was my directly major class, political economy. Um, and it's amazing. That That is basically the main, one of the main reasons why I chose DKU, because its majors are very interdisciplinary. So I get to study both economics and political science, because I didn't want to choose either of them. And political economy class basically combines everything. And especially when you already had some classes, uh, have taken some econ and political science classes separately. 
and you just combine all of that knowledge and they come together when different political theories are explained using economic models. And that is just a perfect fusion of two disciplines uh, that is basically all about the use and disciplinary approach. And I love that class. And that made me realize how much I love my major and what a right choice I made. So yeah, although I love Utah and poli sci, they kind of give me that background knowledge and the foundation for polycon classes. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's go to uh, David. Oh, Russell, I'm, I'm really debating about that because I enjoyed all of them. Uh, to put away one class, I think it would be Chinese class that I'm currently enrolled in and will certainly be enrolled, I feel like, for the whole four years. Um, the class is very small, so we sit in a circle. And uh, we're already at the level where we can fully speak Chinese in the class. So we only use English when we're trying to translate some words or give like a deeper explanation. And it's very fun because uh, most of the learning is more like activity-based, uh, con contextualized drill-based, um, and you really get to talk to your friends on Chinese. And that experience kind of extends beyond the classroom. So whatever we learn during the class and whatever we experiment with during the class in Chinese, we also practice unwillingly in the dining hall. So we greet each other, let's say, in Chinese when we see each other in the dining hall. And it's really fun. I think that's that's something I'll uh, remember for life, except, uh, of course, my Chinese skills that will certainly improve in a very uh, fast pace. That's good to hear, because Mandarin can be a little intimidating for some. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's go to Tekla. Um, I, I, once again, I would like to say two classes. One, with regards to my major, it has to be Philosophy 301, that is Philosophy of Mind, which is one of our first 300 level, like highest level philosophy classes we have. And I feel like I really liked it mostly because of the professor, that's Professor Nathan Hoffholer, who I feel like is one of the most knowledgeable philosopher we have on campus. Um, but most importantly, I liked it because of the class size, because there was only eight of us, or sorry, five of us students and the professor. So it was a very small community and we really got to know each other. And in the end of the end of the class, we went off campus. The professor invited us to like have lunch together. And it was just a really nice community building aspect. But another class I would like to highlight is one of our common core classes. Um, called Global Challenges. I really like the structure of it. It has oral exams, it has simulations, which can be understood as like little modeling of a situation and solve it in teams. So I really like that it it had me work in a team and learn exp or gain experiences from that, as well as just have fun with the class and see how actually things work and how we can resolve these kind of things. So I would definitely highly recommend Global Challenges as one of the best class on campus so far. Awesome. Well, you got a you, you got a, a rousing applause from Kendi. So, <laughs> Kendi, maybe you have something in addition, or you want to echo? <laughs> so, Kendi, um, I think my favorite class and my favorite professor, like the class I like the most, is not taught by my favorite professor. But um, my favorite class so far has been an information science class, InfoSci One Hundred Three. It's like the coolest class I have been to as a comm sci major. It's like a theoretical class and more like leaning into social sciences, but all the algorithms you need to do, like to know all the cool stuff from like back in the days, you get to know like everything from scratch and like in theory, then you can put it into practice. So good. But my favorite professor so far is like my first Chinese professor. So I started my Chinese classes online, but then when I came to campus, I still kept the same professor. She is so sweet. She still teaches like Chinese 100 levels. Like Chinese class in the beginning, like so many people have said, it can be like quite intimidating, but I feel like we have like really nice professors and they take it at like your pace. If you can't keep up with a class, you can like talk to the professor. They, you can have like extra classes. You also have tutoring. So I feel like my first Chinese professor is my favorite professor till date. I mean, I didn't get to go to her wedding, but I got the pictures. So <laughs> yeah, she she's my favorite. <laughs> awesome. Um, how about uh, uh, Leo? 
Mm, this is a tough one, but I think if I had to choose like one of the few is probably Environmental 304, which is um, environmental toxicology. It's literally the class I like wrote about on my admission essay to DKU. So there was a lot writing on it, but it was just so, it was fascinating for me because it was like a combination of like organic chemistry topics, but also like societal concerns as well as like policy making and environmental science. And I remember it was, it, it just so happened that it was just me and another student in the class. And so it was very much just like discussion based every single time with like a, with our professor. And we would talk about like making suggestions to, to like certain governments and how, you know, the chemistry that could back this up. And it really felt like real time, like maybe consulting on how to like solve environmental issues. And also just the, the natural science background that I really wanted from, from some other class that were more like theoretical. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Annie. Okay, so this is for other media arts people, but I think two of my favorite classes have been related to my major. The first one was Media Arts 103. I took this in my freshman year and I actually took it online. So it's basically an introduction to film class. You do a lot of things within that class. You learn about the basics of filmmaking, uh, sound, photography. You're learning all these components that go in to a film, which I'm going to nerd about this, but it's so complex and interesting. But what I like about media arts classes at DKU is that everything is hands on, like you take class time to make things, you take class time to discuss with your peers, you receive feedback from your professors, it's a very engaging, wholesome environment where everyone is like supporting each other to make the best, uh, best film, your best project if possible. And the professor that I took it with, Kaylee Clements, is a very nice professor. He's a very well known documentary of uh, documentary filmmaker from Duke, I believe. And the second favorite class that I took was Arhu 101 with Kyle Yergel. Uh, I think I enjoyed that class a lot because it was a writing class. So it's a creative writing course and you write short things every week. And I like Kyle as well because Kyle was really funny. The class environment felt, it didn't feel like a classroom. It felt like a group of friends that had come together for like a writing session. And I learned a lot from that class and I really did enjoy the atmosphere in both of these classes come to arts and humanities i think that's the best section of dku <laughs> good little major pride there um and so the next question is related to research and so i'm not sure which students have been involved and there's a lot of different ways obviously to get involved in research so i'm going to let you guys kind of come forward on this one um whoever has something to share on this so who of you you know have any of you been involved in research at dku in any way and and, you know, some of this can include signature work for those of you who have already started on that. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what you are doing and maybe how it came about? So I don't know everyone's involvement. So does anybody want to just jump in and start sharing on that? Uh, any of our panelists? Candy? Yeah, I could go. So my research is, um, so the innovation lab, like they put out requests for research, um, like a research submission. So you basically like there's a prompt, you read it as a student, what do you want to research on? Submit your proposal, then get called in for like an interview, talk to the professors about it and then it goes through. So I said, I'm a ComSci major, but my research actually is not as related to ComSci as you would expect. So I am researching into game design and how to infuse culture into game design and see how like, how can we promote culture through game design? So I do not even play video games myself. I am not a huge fan, do not like them, but it's a fun thing to do. It's a fun thing to see. I may be a comp sci major, but I like culture too. So any like there's opportunities for anything you want to do. You can find a connection between things and make it work. Yeah, so it's not like that hard to find research opportunities. Professors put out research uh, research opportunities apply for any of them. There's so many different organizations by campus. And then there's also like professors like looking for research assistants. So if you see like a research opportunity that's open that you like, that goes with your major, that goes with your interest, you should definitely apply. Great, thank you, very insightful. Anyone else, any of our other panelists doing anything? And again, if you wanna talk, oh, Tekla, I see your hand up, please. And then Tim Timaris, we'll go to you next. And then Andy. I currently am working with two philosophy professors on research projects that they are working on. So it's more long-term. So one of them is Logic Lab, where we are currently learning about and hopefully soon starting a paper 
on logic within the law itself. So like American law specifically. And another research I'm working on is habit that, habits that humans have and from a philosophical perspective. But this is currently still more so a reading, a reading group, but it's going to turn into a research hopefully next semester. But as of now, those are the only things I'm working on. I know you've got a lot of other things you're working on as well in terms of your involvements. Uh, Timorous. Uh, so, so far I worked on two researches. Last year I've been working with Humanities Research Center uh, as a research assistant uh, to professor. Uh, we've been doing the main, okay, so uh, we've been doing my Direct responsibility is where to search for different archives in um, Turkish poet and his works and their translation to Russian. Because that project was basically uh, focusing on uh, politics and literature. Uh, how he, that poet was a, quite a significant figure in relationships between South Turkey at the time in 1950s and China. Uh, so basically how the connection worked, uh, he wrote, he mostly wrote his uh, poems in Turkish. Then they were translated to Russian by Soviet Union from Turkish to Russian. And then from Russian, they were translated to Chinese. So basically our focus was on how the narrative and how the meaning was changed through those like various levels and on which stage of translation from Turkish to Russian or Russian to Chinese, the meaning was mostly altered. Uh, and it was a very interesting uh, research because I love literature. I major in political economy. And uh, my work was to find those archival sources to find uh, publications by this poet in Soviet uh, newspapers uh, and, that translate to, and then translate them to English. Uh, so my professor then uh, did the work further by comparing the English version and Chinese and stuff like that. So it was very interesting. Um, and I love that research. I love like reading a lot, um, uh, looking for those, all the resources, all those archival newspapers. And the second research uh, that I'm doing currently um, starting uh, August is the research that I'm uh, doing with uh, Innovation Entrepreneurship Lab at CKU that is currently a partner in a partnership with the World Economic Forum. Uh, basically, what we do, uh, we have a team of five members. Uh, each of us does its specific theme. Uh, mine is the role of Chief Information Officer. Um, and what I do specifically is I analyze different papers, journals, articles on the role of CIO, and I also reach out to and interview the actual CIOs in the industry, and then report it to uh, our supervisor from World Economic Forum. Then we discuss that. Um, that is the cur uh, currently our initial stage of collecting information, but then uh, in next uh, month we'll be switching to the field uh, survey, field research, when we'll probably talk to different companies in China. So yeah, that is. Thank you, thank you. And Annie, I think I saw your hand up for a moment. Yes, you saw correctly. <laughs> uh, I think... <laughs> Uh, so what I did this summer, uh, my research was part of the summer uh, research scholars program. It's basically professors put out listings for research programs that you can take part in during the summer. And I took a, a I did a research project with Professor Li Qiren. Basically, what we did was we went out to these sort of rural villages in China that had been commercialized by incoming artists and entrepreneurs. We interviewed a lot of people. And we collected a lot of film footage, interviews, and materials. And it was about a team of me and about five other people, I believe. And within like three weeks, we had traveled to maybe six to seven different villages across China. We'd spend about two to three days in each one. I think that's the feasible number. And then basically after this, some students put together their own sort of documentaries uh, depicting this complex relationship that happens between 
local villagers and like the entrepreneurs and artists and examining sort of how their economy changes after these people come in. As for me, I'm working on writing a research paper. I'm doing like a photo essay because my medium is photography. So I did a lot of photographic evidence and uh, we'll use information from interviews and things like that to put my paper together to hopefully be published in an academic journal. Oh, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Great, 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 great. Um, so I'm going to move on. I think unless anybody else had anything to share, just raise your hand. But I think we got everybody who had something. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next question, which is, you know, as 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 all the attendees saw in your introductions, you're involved in multiple activities, and you know, one of the biggest challenges, of course. Uh, having lots of interests is figuring out what are going to be most important to you, um, you know, and then figuring out, you know, pr that prioritization and then time management. Can you share the panelists? Can you share which involvement is most important to you and why? And I am going to start with uh, Leo. Hmm. Involvement that's most okay. I think yeah, just the involvement, just or activity, you know, that you've kind of decided to commit some time to. Yeah, some time. Um, <laughs> I'm pretending to think about this, but no, it's actually just um GSRM, um, our LGBT student union. Um, for me, it's like when I was a freshman at DKU when we went online and now we're back in person. And so this like small group of people really kept me like tethered to the community when I felt like really isolated or maybe like um, when I was on campus and feeling homesick as well. Um, it also opened my mind up to like all types of LGBT people that are like around the world and also who are drawn to DKU's campus. Um, it really, it sounds like really preachy and kind of like, you know, uh, <laughs> hippy dippy, but I think it, it really did like sort of make me a more charitable person and sympathetic to other people of, of how they find community, what that means in a sort of um, multicultural context. And now I realize that I've like created this, created as a little high and mighty, I've, I've cultivated this community that is like, spans like years and, and countries and time zones. And I've like met people like I've met some of the best people I've ever met in my life because of GSRM and because of DKU that um, the more time I, I, I put into it, the more I get out of it, um, which I think is like anyone else can say for like any really big, like, you know, club extracurricular sport that they've really found this same sort of community within. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, Annie. So I will say things somewhat similar to Leo because I am the president of our school's volleyball club and I was recently appointed this year so it was a big step being pushed into this leadership position but I feel that I've gained so much from it that I wouldn't regret this choice if I had to choose again. What I like as Leo said like I like this idea of community that was created by our club and for me because I'm really passionate about volleyball I really like finding other students I like we like we enjoy playing together we have such a comfortable atmosphere where everyone is just like oh come play come play you know let's goof around let's do something silly uh i'm really glad that also that speaking from like sports culture and sports as an athlete people uh, you can see people's growth over one semester and i think that's something that i was very proud of uh especially in our team because as tamiris mentioned in our dk we had our dku invitational last weekend and our women's volleyball team uh, I'm very proud to say we placed first, guys. We're really good. I'm very happy to say that. And I'm, I do enjoy it. That's probably the biggest thing that I have dedicated myself to outside of academics, because what I like about DKU is that it's very easy for you to become involved in things, and it's very easy for you to start your own thing. So if you're passionate about something, just go for it. Just go for it. Develop it. And I'm sure that it gains traction within DKU. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, David. For me, as I said, it's uh, DKU Sailing Club and just sailing with DKU people. It just so happened that we have two more sailors today at the session, which are Techline Tomers. Uh, uh, we recently participated in a sailing competition together, actually, and 
uh, won the fifth spot together. And all that considering that we've been only doing this for two months. Um, I started from zero, I'll talk for myself. And now with my friends, I can already sail a, an eight meter long boat. I think that's a big success. Uh, we get to train with people from outside DKU and inside DKU. And uh, it's a really unique sport that uh, you can also extend to your experience at Duke because Duke has also a sailing club. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Candy. Um, I think one of the, like the most meaningful activities I have been involved in is probably like the school's robotics team, the VAX robotics team. I mean, sleeping late coding or like making robots is not the one thing everyone wants to do at night, but it's been really fun going out to like other universities, competing, losing and winning and just like the adrenaline rush when everyone's just speaking Chinese around you and you have your one, two sentences you're trying to keep up with, but it has been fun so far. The involvement has been great. I've been able to like travel around, learn new things, work with people, not only like undergrads, we also have like grad students working with us. So it's just like totally mind blowing how much you think you know, but there's so much more out there that you don't know. And it's a really like fun place. I know like when I say robotics sounds like, oh my God, that's huge, da, da, da. but it's actually really fun to like hang out with those people and just be stupid sometimes outside doing like the cool stuff. Yeah. Great, hey, thanks. Uh, Tekla. Um, I would like to once again highlight two things. Um, one of them is, as David said, the sailing club. It was, I honestly joined the sailing club purely out of curiosity, just to see what it was all about. And I just fell in love with the sport. And then I've been going, we created such a small and close community and we're able to work as a team, which is incredible to think about that we've achieved that in like two months. Um, so I have to highlight sailing as one of the favorites of mine. But as for other form of involvement, which is student worker positions, I would like to highlight working with international enrollment because I am really passionate about the KU and I feel really happy that I'm able to share it with other prospective students or deciding students. And I'm also just very excited to, you know, get to know the future generation of DKU. So generally speaking, I really like working with international enrollment as well and with Russell, of course. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you. Um, Tomaris. Um, for me, it's my research uh, with World Economic Forum that I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, what it gives me uh, specifically that what I'm interested in are four things. First of all, is um, I get to experience different roles in the industry um, as a political economy major and what can I do in the future. For example, I'm doing research now for companies, basically like a consulting, because we need to come up with a report with recommendations. Um, and I get to experience that and um, learn for myself whether I like it or not, whether I want to do that in the future or not. Um, and another thing is that uh, through that project, I get to learn more about the China's market and in general how companies and uh, cooperation between different uh, companies work in China, because our focus is greater mainland of China. So that and as well as the fact that we are uh, tightly, closely working with World Economic Forum, we have a supervisor from there. and. Uh, that is great opportunity uh, for networking. Uh, that is very valuable after graduation, as we all know. And at the same time, um, it's advisory from a professional in your field. Uh, for example, we talked a lot in our, like after our weekly meetings, uh, what may, like what projects we can do, what masters we can do, what uh, prospects in general we have. So it is an amazing, uh, professional experience for me. 
Such great answers, you guys. Um, I just want to, you know, what we're going to do next is I'm going to have Abdullah, who's been doing an amazing job with the support of our panelists, answering questions throughout. And boy, have those questions been flying. So we really appreciate those. Um, I'm going to guide you guys. I've saw, I've seen some application related questions, some admissions related questions. I definitely put the email in there for um, our office. Now, some of you are probably already hearing from recruiters who might be responsible for your your area. You always can reach out to us. Reach out to me. If you've gotten an email from me directly, reach out to the recruiters. But if you don't have that email, um, don't know who that is, you can definitely reach out to that international uh, admissions uh, email that I put in there. Um, also, I saw several questions related to application, admissions, essay writing, all of that. Well, guess what? what we do I do uh, a couple sessions called director's application advice sessions so that's exactly what I cover in that session I talk about the qualities we look for and why right so I can help you connect your story to DKU's story which you've gotten some great insight into DKU's story in today's panel um, I also talk specifically about the why DKU essay and how to put that story together. Um, so I'm going to pop into the chat here uh, where you can sign up for one of those sessions. I have two more before um, our regular decision deadline of January 2nd. Uh, one's, I think, on December 23rd. One's on December 27th. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about our application process, you can also just reach out to me if you like, if, you, if you're in my area or one of our recruiters. But if you want to wait for that session, you can also wait for that session. It'll be a great way to get some guidance on your application and how to weave those key themes throughout those qualitative components and connect again your story to DKU's story. Um, so um, now I'm going to invite, uh, now I'm going to invite uh, Abdullah, who's again been doing an amazing job, to bring forward a couple questions that have maybe been those most frequently asked or will be, you know, can be best answered and, and shared with our panelists. So Abdullah, I'm going to invite you up. And if you want to ask the panelists uh, a couple questions. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, before just that, um, I have just two questions I feel like that summarize the, what the chat has been trying to ask and general theme, what the general theme has been. Um, before that, just like a, a bunch of brief comments, I kind of like, it kind of like all these questions and everyone just kind of being here brought me back to my time. And I understand why these questions exist and what, and the reason these questions are being asked is because it's a big step in life. Like you graduate high school and you're about to step into this part where you're not only everything you're doing is on your own, but also like you want to get it perfect, like absolutely just right. So that your choice doesn't become a what if in a later part of your life. The advice for that is pretty simple. The comparisons you can consistently do with all the other colleges, countries, or lives that you could possibly choose, they're always going to be that what if for you. What the ultimate thing is to actually embrace the choice um, that you are making, which could be DK, which could be any other college, and then live up to that and then give and just take what you're given and then use that opportunity to make the most out of it. That'll be true for DKU and that'll be true for anything else. Um, and the reason I chose this cho choice and to, to, and chose this part of my life was simply because of what it had to offer the uncharted territory and the absolute curiosity of like okay this is something that I have no research about it's something that I don't know at all about and what I'm what I'm being offered is a chance to talk to to be friends with to engage on a daily life with people who have lived vastly different lives from me if you want to know how much how, what what I exactly mean you can literally just take a look at the participants in the zoom chat and just take a look not only like some some of you have cameras on some of you don't so you can take a look at them you can take a look at their names the countries that they're from and that only that will simply prove my point of what DKU is and what DKU will be if you choose to join this for the next four years so like one of the main questions and so in, in the in the theme of you know wanting to be this perfect choice uh, one of the biggest questions that everyone has asked along these lines and generally directly as well is what makes a person a DKU student? What kind of students does DKU really want? And that's something that I really want you to guys to talk about. Okay. Like as if you were admission officers or like generally what you feel that is a DKU student, which is something that a lot of people are really curious about. And then we'll move on to the second question. Thank you. All right. Let's, let's start with uh, Tekla. Um. 
I think one of the most important factors for a DQ student is that they are curious, but curious in a way of curious about other cultures, curious about China, curious about academics, curious about themselves. Most importantly, that they want to know more. And this want to know more can mean anything as long as it means something to you. And I think this curiosity also comes with the fact that DKU students place themselves into like the outside zone of their comfort zone. So it's very important that DKU students are very curious, very outgoing, very much want to know more about the world. And that's why they come to DKU. Great. I think we're going to start hearing some of those qualities that you guys were asking about. Uh, what are those qualities? And that's absolutely one. Uh, uh, David. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you should be very open-minded, as Tegla said. Uh, but at the same time, I think it also matters for you to be a very curious learner. Uh, so to go deep into everything, right? Rather be focused on a few small things um, and to go deep into them. And that's, I think, what our DKU community encourages. Uh, we're, we're pretty small um, and we get the opportunities to really talk to each other, to really explore our backgrounds, to form these friendships that will last for our lives. And I feel like that's very uh, crucial part of being uh, a real, you know, the already OG original uh, DK were. Excellent. Leo. Hmm. I think for me, it's like the, the ability to be adaptable or be willing to, uh, to like <laughs> build that up within yourself. Um, because if, if I'm not sugarcoating, you'll find in in a situation like this you you might be in an uncomfortable situation if you're having cultural differences if maybe you're just having a tough time in one of your classes you need to be able to sort of pick yourself up realize what mistakes you've maybe made how can you learn from this um how can you go forward you know as a more resilient and you know well-informed person and I think as as amazing as our students are and how many achievements that they had, I think we have equally as many like mistakes or learning moments or even failures that sort of make us stronger in the process. You know, I'm I'm not a perfect student, but I think I'm a much better student and like member of the DKU community because I've like faced a lot of like social and academic issues like head on and tried to become a better person from that. And I don't think I would have gotten that in a situation where I'm inside my comfort zone, you know, being outside of your comfort zone is uncomfortable. And if you're okay with that, then eventually it'll become larger. And I think that's one of the, the best pieces of advice that I can give for someone who's wondering whether or not they would be a good fit for DKU. Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, Tamiris. I started with saying that I don't know what to add to uh, to other people's responses because I agree uh, and there's nothing new but one thing that I just wanted to point out maybe once again about um, Dickie's community is how friendly and welcoming is everyone everyone is here to help you out and you never know where that help might come from and it's and it was very surprising in the very few like months I think because uh, what do you expect from such a competitive uh, and you know when everyone is so good and ambitious and competitive that's not something you would expect but that is totally the opposite and that is something that it is a common uh character trait that i notice in every single student at dku and i think that is just amazing i love that about us there we got that answer for sure uh annie mm, i think one thing about dku students is that we're all very ambitious and passionate uh, I can think of like, especially when you look at these panelists, it's like, we're all doing this and this and this and this and this. It feels like we're all doing things that we're very passionate about. And what I enjoy about DKU is that, as I said before, like there's so many opportunities here that we all just become involved. And as Samira said, like we're such a small community that our paths overlap so much. What's it's nice, it's like we can be in completely different kind of sections, like academic sections, but we still end up meeting somewhere. We end up finding some kind of common ground. 
And I think like what I like is that it really fosters a strong sense of community, especially between like the international students and the Chinese students. I think that we have a great community here and there's so many different areas that we eventually end up overlapping in. And we do so many things together where it's like, I've seen the same person like six times in one day where it's just like, we're such a small community. And I really like that. I really like, oh, oh I have low power. Anyways, I really like that because I came from a very small high school. So being able to be in this community where I don't feel so isolated, it feels like I end up knowing everyone eventually. And I really like that about DK because we all eventually get to know each other at some point. Excellent. Uh, Kendi. I think the one quality I'd say like about every DKU student is like, we all have like some level of audacity. And I use the word audacity because I feel like it takes so much to like leave your parents, leave your country, go into a whole new culture, just immerse yourself, take classes on seven week sessions, not give up, keep going, have extracurriculars, have a social life, go out with your friends and like learn new things, do research, like we find time to do the things we like to do, regardless of the situations. We could be panicking about majors and everything, but we'll still have time to like have fun with our friends, go talk to professors. So I feel like starting a whole new life in a whole new different country and actively taking opportunities that are available to you without like panicking or like being afraid or feeling like you're not good enough for something, it does take some amount of audacity. So I'd say you have to have like a really good amount of audacity to be a DKA student. And don't be afraid to take up opportunities. Don't be afraid to go out there and like try new things. Great, great. So Tekla, I see you popped your hand up. Yeah, I want to add to Candy's and Annie's point. I feel like a core quality for DKU students is, is that they are not afraid to be pioneers. Mm -hmm. DKU is still a very new university and its students are the ones that are really shaping it, right? So if you want to start something, this is the place to do. It is also the place to, you know, really discover yourself, who you want to be, what do you want to do? I mean, as I said, with me, with sailing, I never knew I wanted to do sailing. Now I do. Um, but generally speaking with pioneering, I think it's very important to know that if you come to DKU, you will shape DKU as well as DKU shaping you. So it's important to be a global leader, as we would like to say here at DKU. You guys, this has been, I mean, I love listening to you because I learn so much from you um, constantly, but boy, do you reflect the DKU community and the qualities that we look for. You guys did such a good job capturing it. I have one final question um, because I know it is something that comes up a lot for students, um, you know, coming to China, you guys have touched on it a little bit for many of our students means coming a long way for university, leaving those familiar surroundings, friends and family. Um, I've definitely spoken to, to several students who have been admitted or who are trying to make that final choice over the years. They're torn over this. They're so excited about the idea of studying at DKU, being in China. The student community resonates with them, the interdisciplinary curriculum, all of those things. But ultimately, they were nervous about the distance and leaving those friends and family. So any advice for those in our audience today who might be kind of having those similar thoughts? Um, and Tekla, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think one of the most important things to know that if you already have the idea of going abroad, you have that adventurous spirit in you and you may just, you know, suppress it out of fear. I feel like fear is a good thing and sometimes it's best to act up on it. So while it may seem scary and of course there's a lot of things you put online, from my experience, things will stay the same at home even though you'll be going abroad. Um, but it's important to know that if you come to the KU, you will get like a second family here who will treat you just like you were back home. You will be able to celebrate your own traditions. You will have a community. You will have friends who will become your family eventually. So while it does seem scary, I feel like it's very important to step out of your comfort zone and act up on your little fears. And I would also just like to note that from my experience, going abroad, especially to a place like China, 
not only does it um, widen your perspective, but it also makes you appreciate home in a different way. So it's very important to step out of this comfort zone and really appreciate your home as well. I love seeing all the head nodding of our fellow panelists. Uh, I'm going to go with Leo. Leo, please. Mm, so for context, I've been like away from home for about mm, a year and a few months now. Um, and similar to Tekla, like, like I love my parents, but I didn't know that I like actually loved them until I was away from them. I was like, oh, my relationship with my family is so much better now that we don't live together. It's amazing. Um, and, you know, if I understand you're like a senior in high school and you're worried about like really close friends or maybe like relationships and, and things that like, you know, they're staying home, but I'm leaving. What, what, how can I maintain that? And I find that it's really people grow and people change and you you will find that sometimes people will not be as easy to maintain contact with but sometimes it'll be even better as before um my best friend from high school who I've been I've pretty much talked to every day now since maybe like 2014 she's still in America through time differences through you know vacations work things we still talk every day and we still like video call every week and that was never an issue for us because it's really like with the people who matter, they will make time for you. And, you know, when things are tough, or maybe you, you don't feel as connected to the people back home, you have people here, you know, I'm, I'm like planning trips and like, you know, like all of these things with people that I met at DKU. And it's sort of like, I couldn't imagine it any other way. Um, and it's, it's nice to, to realize that like, all of these worries, they're not like, permanent and th there's always like other people to fill that same sort of like need for love and connection that you feel now thank you very much um candy there seem to be some things resonating with you about what leo was sharing <laughs> go next yeah i mean i feel like for me it was a bit different in the sense that my parents are still in kenya but like almost all my friends moved to the u.s for college so it's like my relationships were split into two so it's like I am far away from both sides, both my family and my friends. But like Leo said, you'll always like find ways to connect, find ways to chat. It's annoying to get calls at 3 a.m. because they think you're in the same time zone. But if they don't call you at 3 a.m., are they really your friends? So <laughs> I feel like you will, you will always like have time to connect. And it's not easy to be like away from home. So many things change in like a short time. So many things happen. And sometimes you feel like you want to be there just like for the experience and to be with your family. But I feel like once you've made the decision to like go and study abroad, that is what is good for you at this point. And I feel like things will work out in the end. And life, like just don't think about the bad things. Like life is just like, it's like that. There has to be a balance of like both the good and the bad. But when you think about it from like where you are, regardless of the changes going on at home, there's so much that is going on for you as an individual. Like there's so much good happening to you. You are studying, you're in a place to develop like professionally, you have made new relationships and have still kept the ones from home. So like weighing the pros and cons, I feel like you are still at a better place than you would have been if you stayed back home. So it's really okay to go out there regardless of the changes and the fear that you have. Things will work out in the end somehow. There's always a, like a way. You'll always find a way. Thank you, Candy. Uh, Annie, going to come to you next. Oh, uh, don't hear you. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Sorry. That's my mistake. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think a lot of my answers that I want to touch on are similar to both Leo and Candy's answers. It's like being so far away from your family, uh, I guess. Let me start. For reference, like I have been in China since the start of my freshman year. Uh, I'll be going home this summer, but I basically haven't gone home for almost two years now. And I think even if you're far apart, you're still connected with your family. What I think my parents were so worried about me going away from home as most parents are. They were so worried about these things. But for me, like I think that there's so much that I could gain from this experience that I just wanted to show them. Like there's so there's there's a wide, vast horizon of possibilities and there's so much I can do. 
and what I like now is that even if I'm away from home, I'm still texting friends from back home. I'm still, you know, sharing my experiences with people. We're still talking about our lives because even though our paths have changed, there's still things that have changed in our lives. We can still share those differences. We can talk about our lives. And I think that sense of like friendship and family hasn't changed so much in that factor because I still keep in touch with a lot of friends from back home, despite the time differences. But I think that yeah, I think that there's just a lot that happens here and I just want to share it with my parents even though it's like 12 a.m and I'm telling them mom there's so much going on but in the end like it's so overwhelming there's so much there's so much happening but then if I were to choose something else I'd look back on this and I think I don't know if I could choose something else if that makes sense. Russell, you're muted. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> uh, Demaris. Um, so in my case, I would like to agree with everyone else that uh, wait, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I just connected from my phone just in case my laptop will turn off suddenly. <laughs> so um basically one thing uh, is that yeah, I agree with everyone else that the the connection if it's a genuine connection with your friends or with your family then it will stay strong for instance we had a friend group um with like five closest friends and two of us are currently well basically one of us in is in new york city right now one of us is in la one of us is in paris shanghai and london and basically it's just three people at the time talking together because two others are sleeping probably and it's working and we're we have we still have that bond we're still talking to each other and we love that so it's all about adjusting and adapting same with the family um uh, it's just amazing and also not only about your old connections but for me personally i would never think that i could connect on such a deep level with my friends right now at dku who came from completely different backgrounds from completely different cultures countries cities uh, completely different and currently my friend group is just as diverse as DKU and it's amazing and I have such a deep genuine connection with them that that they just literally became my second family here and um, a, a quite a different stance from other students um, actually being abroad um, it's a, also an opportunity you can just uh, see it as an opportunity to connect with your with people from your culture, with fellow people with from your uh, language uh, area or country. For example, I had an opportunity to connect with like Kazakhstani students and workers and professionals here uh, in China. And I actually had a couple of events together where I had an experience where I had an opportunity to volunteer for them, to work with them. And we're just like as Kazakhstani people in China are connecting as well. And I know from other students uh, at DKU, they're connecting with their communities uh, in China as well. And that is a different perspective that you can look at, that it's, a, it's an opportunity to connect with people that you probably wouldn't meet back in your home country. But here in China, you suddenly bond, you work together, have fun. So that's another way to look at that really cool perspective there and you're right i've heard that about connecting with the broader relative communities relevant communities that are outside of dku very very cool and good point um david i think uh i think we're about wrapped up so david final thoughts on this point yeah to wrap this up i'll just uh give you one small advice if you are thinking to study abroad and specifically at dku uh, when I was going for my first time, for ex first extended time abroad, before that, um, I just went to a nearby city with my friends for a few days, just to get the feel of how it feels being away from home. And the feeling was I felt more connected to my family, as other people have mentioned, and it so continued to be at DKU. Uh, there are so many more things to share, uh, so many more pictures to send to your family that's uh, very nice also and you're also very welcome uh, to bring your family to China and show them around travel with them uh, many students do that 
And it's just another opportunity to even be closer to your family. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, guys. I'm just putting in my email in the chat here. Um, there you go. Uh, I just want to say thank you to attendees for coming and, and spending time with us. Um, and my heartfelt thanks to our panelists, who I know this is very late for you. Thank you, thank you so much, all of you, David, Kendi, Leo, Tekla, Tomaris, Annie, Abdullah. Thank you guys so, so much. Uh, you guys are such great reflections of, of who DKU is. And, uh, you know, I hope that this resonated with the, our audience. And uh, if it did, there's lots more for you to learn about. Uh, you can join some of the sessions. You, there's posted links that you can get to different sessions. And we just look forward to, you know, talking to you further. Don't hesitate to reach out to the panelists, to myself, to any member of our team. Um, thank you, everybody, no matter where you are in the world. Have a great rest of your day, a great morning, a great evening. Get some sleep, my friends in China. Bye, everybody.